Please take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to be looking at some scriptures this morning. The title for the message this morning is very simply the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Last week I preached on salvation. And this week is kind of like part two of what I believe God wants to do. There's a, there's a blessing, I believe, in, in focusing on the foundation of who we are as a people. And we don't want to get too far away from Jesus and the Holy Spirit in our midst. It says in Acts 1, starting in verse 8, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Let's pray together. Father, give us ears to hear what you're speaking to us. Commune with our spirit, Lord, as our spirit opens up to you. And Lord, I pray that this morning that you would place your word into our hearts and that our hearts today would contain good soil. That as we apply it, Lord, that it would take root in us and grow in us and become strong in us. The Father, you would change us and transform us from glory to glory to glory, Lord, releasing us into the fullness of your purpose and the fullness of your destiny for each one of us and for this congregation. And so this morning, we give you praise, we give you thanksgiving. Holy Spirit, we invite you to move among us, to come upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. How many of you know that the, the Holy Spirit in us and the Holy Spirit upon us are two different things? See, I believe the Holy Spirit comes into us when we come to Jesus and are saved. The Bible says that none of us can come to the Lord except the Spirit of the Lord draw us to himself. And last week I talked about how Jesus is our lifeguard, if you will, how he rescues us from a sea of sin. And it was, it's an atmosphere of water, if you will, that we were never created to live in. And yet many, many people, we've been born into sin, the Bible tells us, and we live there never realizing that we were not created to stay there. And that Jesus is the lifeguard that rescues us. And what happens is when he brings us up on shore, if you will, he brings us out of sin. But many times there's, there's still, you know, how many have ever been a lifeguard here? Anybody been a lifeguard and had that training? If you've ever saved someone, most of the time they've taken some water in their lungs. And so they're either out because they've passed out or they're coughing and this kind of thing. And it's like Jesus does mouth to mouth with us. And he breathes his breath into each one of us and he brings life. It's the same picture that happened with Adam in the garden. You know, God took a, a mound of dirt. Hallelujah. How many of you know that you're just a mound of dirt? And, and yet the Lord, Jesus, by his spirit, if you will, breathed into Adam. The Bible says that God breathed into Adam by his spirit. His spirit was imparted to Adam and Adam came alive. No longer a mound of clay and dirt, but life. And it's that same process of breathing into you at salvation, the Holy Spirit coming into you. He saves us, and that breath of God is the very life. And that, at that point, we're reborn because we are now find ourselves in a different atmosphere. When the Holy Spirit comes upon us, we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And baptism literally means immersion or immersed. And just like when you were in a sea of sin, you were immersed in that sin, you may not even realize it. When you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you're now surrounded by another reality. It's His presence and it's fellowship with the Spirit of the living God. How many of you know what a chocolate fountain is? <laughs> How many of you like them? <laughs> You know, I'm, I mean, I'm a fan of chocolate, but I'm really not a big fan of the chocolate fountain. I mean, if they're at like an event or something like that, they're okay. You know, like a catered event or a wedding reception or something like that. You know, that's, that, that's okay. That's fine. But you know what? It was interesting because um, 
I saw in the commercials that now they have them at Golden Corral. And, and something just is a little unsettling about public access to a chocolate fountain. And my wife is reining me in right now. But, you know, you, you, you have a chocolate fountain, you put chocolate in the fountain, but nothing happens until you plug it in and turn it on. And then what happens? The chocolate comes in, overflows the fountain, and people can receive the chocolate. Well, that's a picture of the Holy Spirit. You have the Spirit inside of you. But is the Spirit flowing over you so that others can be blessed? The Bible says that from us as believers, that rivers of living water will flow forth from our belly. Now that's simply a picture of your life baptized in the Holy Spirit flowing forth in all that God created. The Holy Spirit comes upon us. And the Bible says that when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, that we shall receive power. How many of you know that people, we, you and me, were never meant to depend on human strength? We were not created to be able to do it ourselves. And that's why some of you are getting tired of living the life that you're living. Because you're trying to do everything in your own strength to change yourself, to transform yourself, to make yourself better. That's ultimately why self-improvement kinds of things, they can be good for a season for a while, but they won't save you. We were never meant to depend upon human strength. We were created, if you will, to be power-assisted and so when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Bible says that the reason that you're baptized is you shall receive power. How many of you are old enough here to remember vehicles before power steering? Okay, the rest of y'all are blessed. We used to have a truck, a big truck, farm truck. And I've driven a number of trucks in my life, like larger trucks, you know, commercial trucks. And... You know, when, you're dri when you were a truck driver 50 years ago, it was a hard job because you had to literally steer the truck without any assistance and you had to muscle anywhere you wanted to go. But now they have power steering and you can literally steer that, st that you know, with, with your pinky if you want to. Why? Because it's power assisted and that's also a picture of how it is with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you have power to do what God has called you to do. It's not in your own human strength. You can do a little bit in your own strength. But you can do so much more. The Bible says we can do more things exceedingly above all that we can even think or ask when the Holy Spirit is assisting us, when His power comes upon us. And the reason that the power of the Holy Spirit has come upon us is so that we can witness for the purpose of representing Jesus to the world. He says in Jerusalem, your home area, community, your family, your relatives, in Judea and into Samaria, city, surrounding region, to the uttermost parts of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit isn't given just so you can be blessed and enjoy it. That's part of it. But a greater part is so that you can fulfill the purposes that God has for you. Some of us here today need to get our eyes off of ourselves and begin to focus on what God would have us to move into. I didn't hear an amen. Some of us here need to get our eyes off of ourselves. Some of you can depress yourself just looking at yourself. And it's not because you don't look good. It's your light. You know, it's like sometimes we, we focus on ourselves so much. And it's like, look, wait a minute. There's a greater purpose here that you have been filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit so that you can move into. And if you will focus on the purposes of God, what, is the, what does the Bible say? When you focus on the kingdom of God, what his purposes is for the kingdom, all these other things that you, he already knows that you need, desire, whatever, will be added unto you. It's a key. In the kingdom. Jesus said it this way. 
about receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. John 16, 7 and 8. However, I am telling you nothing. This is the Amplified, by the way. I am telling you nothing but the truth. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, strengthener, standby will not come to you into close fellowship with you. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. And when he, the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness, uprightness of heart and right standing with God and about judgment. The Holy Spirit desires to draw all persons to Jesus Christ. And he desires to utilize you and me as his representatives, representing Jesus. Jesus has already come. He's already presented himself. It's up to us to represent or represent him to the world in which we find ourselves. It says he will convict, he will convince the world to bring demonstration to it, power of God. Paul said in a couple of different places, he said, I don't come with words, I don't come with wisdom, but I come in the demonstration of the power of God. Do you realize that that is the key to seeing lives change? People don't want to hear your words. They want to see a demonstration of God. People will not be argued into the kingdom. But when they see a demonstration of God's power through a, a humble believer, it makes an impact. And that's a challenge for you and I. It's not about convincing people to receive Jesus. It's about demonstrating His grace, demonstrating His power, demonstrating His mercy, and letting the Holy Spirit draw them in. See, in order to accomplish this, the Holy Spirit, through the Holy Spirit gives gifts to all of us. But it's all for the demonstration of His power so that people can believe. For example, the, the, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit giving a gift of healing. The gift of healing isn't so you can say, oh, look at me, I healed somebody. It's so that the person who received the healing has received a demonstration of the power of God. Or the gift of miracles. The miracle has a, re a person that needs to receive it. Or a situation that needs to change. To demonstrate God's power. To make an impact in the life of that person. All of these witness to the reality of Jesus. And demonstrate His power. The first time that this occurred where believers were baptized in the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit came upon them, was what we celebrate today, Pentecost. It says in Acts 2, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord and in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a, mighty, a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was the inauguration of the Holy Spirit. I haven't heard or seen in the Scripture or otherwise of, of a, this exact kind of situation. It was like God Himself was saying, look, I'm pouring something out on you, this is a red letter day, if you will. And the Holy Spirit in his presence coming upon believers. In this case, it was 120, about 120 disciples were gathered together and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Together they were seeking God. They had humbled themselves. They were submitted to what the word that Jesus had spoken to them. Jesus told about 520, 525 people saw him ascend into heaven, said, go, wait for me, and you'll know it when it happens. Out of that 525, about 120 were left. For you're too critical of them, what would you do? If Jesus told you, told us, I want you to go into the sanctuary, 
I want you to wait. Don't go home. Don't go to your job. If you need to eat, order pizza. They'll bring it in. How long would you wait? And out of that 520, 525, 120 remained faithful to the word, submitted to the word that they had received from Jesus. And it says suddenly, suddenly, they weren't expecting what they received. A sound came from heaven like a rushing wind. And it was a sound unlike anything that they had experienced before. And divided tongues as of a flame of fire sat upon each one. I want you to notice something there. It wasn't simply on the 12 apostles. It wasn't simply upon the leaders. The flame, there was a flame for each person. And how many of you know that each of us has a purpose and a destiny that the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, only that can accomplish. The Holy Spirit and His baptism is for each and every one of us so that we can fulfill the purposes of God that He has placed over us and upon us. They were immersed, filled, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And an evidence of that was they began to speak with other languages that they hadn't learned. At that particular time, the Jews were celebrating a festival and people from all over the world had come to Jerusalem for just that occasion. And when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and the Spirit had come upon them, they came out of that room, they were speaking with other tongues in other languages and the miracle was that people were there that began to hear the wonders and the greatness of God in their native tongue. And that drew a crowd. Do you think that would draw a crowd today? How many here have ever been to a festival? You went to rock festival. I mean, maybe you don't want to admit this. Don't raise your hand. Did you ever go to a rock and roll festival when you were like 18? You know, you have thousands of people around these bands and all. But what would happen if the Holy Spirit began to break out at a rock festival? On the fringe of all the, the field or wherever it is. And something began to happen that drew everybody's attention away from the original purpose that they had come in the first place. And that's what happened here. The Holy Spirit broke in to their situation. And in the midst of this, Peter begins to preach. Peter begins to expound on Jesus. He stands up and he begins to preach the gospel. Now I want to take note of this. This is the same Peter that about two months earlier had denied Christ. This was the Peter that was following along behind Jesus. There were several other disciples. Most of the disciples had scattered. But Peter had come pretty close. And Jesus had prophesied to him. He said, you're going to deny me three times. Peter said, no, not me. And wouldn't you know it, Peter denied that he knew Jesus when Jesus needed, got in trouble, if you will, needed him the most. And the Bible says that Jesus looked right at Peter and Peter realized, remembered what he had said. He was humbled. He was broken. What changed? Peter that denied Christ two months later, Peter comes out of the upper room and he begins to preach and he begins to declare the praises of God. It wasn't that he received Jesus. He knew Jesus. I mean, Jesus had discipled him personally. Spent three, three and a half years with the boy. Peter still wasn't changed very much. But Jesus had poured into him. It wasn't that he didn't know Jesus. It's that he had been baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit had come upon him. And now instead of denying Christ, he was preaching Christ. He was declaring the praises of the Lord. And he was articulate. He was purposeful. 
And he became the leader of the early church. After this new experience, Peter was a literal demonstration of the power of God to change and to transform an individual. How many of you need that kind of change and transformation today? Let me ask a deeper question. How many of you desire that kind of transformation today? Because you see, sometimes when the, when the Lord comes upon us in His Holy Spirit fullness, it changes our lives in such a radical way that we can't go back to the way it used to be. And one of the things that we have to fight against is our own comfortableness. We like our lives the way that it is. If Peter had liked his life the way it was, he would have never become the apostle that we know of him today. The Bible says that after this experience, he preached about 3,000 people were added to the kingdom in that afternoon or that morning afternoon. How many of you would like to see 3,000 souls added to the kingdom today? How many of you are available to help it to happen? What do we need to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Three things. You need desire. You need to want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And it can't just be a casual, you know what, I think I'll try this on. And I'll go around for a little bit. And now I don't really like this and take it back to the store kind of, uh, of desire. This is something that you have to understand that the God wants for you. It is for you today. And you begin to seek him and desire to know him. The, dis the disciples waited in the upper room because they expected something to happen. You know, I believe that many times today, the church at large, they gather together and we really don't expect anything to happen. So guess what? Nothing happens. You get what you expect. And there's so much more that the Holy Spirit wants to offer, but he's not going to force himself upon us. It's a desire that we seek Him in His fullness and that we're not satisfied until we receive. And we may not be able to qualify what it looks like, but we know it when we get it. When I was about 20, I had received Jesus. When I was 12 years old, I was baptized, okay? In the denomination where, they, that where I grew up, the way this was is everybody at about age 12 was baptized. And it was really kind of, I mean, as I look back on it, I'm glad for it. But it was, it was just interesting because we really hadn't, there was no talk of Jesus necessarily. It was just you need to be baptized. Okay. And so there was about seven of us 12-year-old boys that they took in a room. They set us down in a line. And they said, now y'all behave. That's a miracle in and of itself. But... And they, they began to talk, do you, you know, do you know Jesus? Do you, and we, we, we really hadn't had much, but they said, we're going to baptize you today. Okay. And so then they took us up front of the church, and the way that that particular denomination did baptisms was they poured over the front of our face, and we were baptized. When I was 19, I committed my life to Jesus at a second chapter of Acts concert. Anybody remember the second chapter of Acts? Uh-huh. 1980. That was cutting edge back then. Today it's elevator music, but all right. And I received Jesus and something happened inside of me. I received salvation, but I also received a sense of his presence, a sense of his fullness that I hadn't experienced before. And I had no explanation for it, except that something had exchanged spiritually. And now things were different. But I also had this feeling that there, there had to be more. And, and I began to seek God. And I was reading his word and praying and, you know, leading worship at that point. I began to lead worship about three months later. 
It was a gifting that God had laid on my heart and life. And, 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 but I'm seeking. I'm saying, you know what? There's got to be more. And I was in college at the time. And it was my junior year, I believe it was, that there was a girl that came from somewhere in Pennsylvania to college where I was at for that spring. And there was never a relationship as in romantic relationship or anything. But she began, we, we struck up a, 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 a relationship and she began to talk to me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, the denomination that I grew up in, the only time we mentioned the Holy Spirit was we sang the doxology, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I knew about the Father. I knew about the Son. Holy Ghost, I have no idea what that is. But we're going to sing it. And she began to tell me, about an experience of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And you know, I tried to knock her off her game. I was like, what do you mean? Holy Spirit. See, many times what happens is the grid that we possess and grow up with is the grid that we filter everything else through. And we never question whether the grid that we were given as we grew up was actually of God. You understand what I'm saying? And so anything that doesn't fit the grid is suspect. And maybe it's not what is suspect that we need to worry about. What we need to worry about is the grid that we've been given. Because how many of you know that God is not going to be put in a box? That he will knock us out of our boxes. He will, he will expand our grids. He will do things just to upset your inner sense of self. He will. He'll put you in situations that'll flat out irritate you. Some of y'all been irritated. He does that so that we don't continue in the same patterns of thinking that we have continued in up until that time. He wants to expand our vision to include all that he has to offer us and all that he desires to extend to us. And so I'm seeking God. This girl is talking to me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I'm going back and forth with her. And she gives me a book by a man named Dennis Bennett who was an Episcopalian church leader from, not about in, from in the 60s and the 70s and, 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 and one of the early charismatic leaders. He was a, an Episcopalian priest of all people. I didn't know any Episcopalians. They might as well have been heathen as far as I knew. And I read this book and it really sparked my interest. And I came to the place where I said, okay, Maybe. And I had this inner sense that, you know, if I submit myself to this, things could change. <laughs> now, I had a good life. It was summertime. After that spring semester, I was working construction, earning money, doing masonry work. And one day it rained. And I had to stay home. And so I'm sitting alone in my apartment on my sofa and I had gotten to that place of desperation where I was really frustrated inside. I said, God, if this is of you, if this is real, God, I want it. Baptize me in your Holy Spirit. And I sat there. Now, I want to tell you something. There were no fireworks that went off. I didn't see stars. There was no angelic choir singing Amazing Grace. But I sat there and something, the Spirit of the living God came upon me and the next thing that I said, I didn't understand. <laughs> and that freaked me out. Because the denomination didn't talk about the Holy Spirit, much less speaking in tongues. And I realized I could stop and I could start. 
But something changed that day. I was all alone. I was by myself. I received. I said, God, if you are real, I want what you have to offer me. And my life changed radically from that time. You need to desire it. You know what? If you don't want it, you're probably not going to get it. The second thing that you need to do to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit is we need humility. What do we need to receive the baptism? We need humility. The disciples submitted themselves. They waited in the upper room. How many of you know that pride hinders what God wants to do in our lives? And see, many times we have these preconceived ideas of what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, either for it or against it. And we say, you know what, this is what this must mean. And we have these excessive kinds of fluffy ideas. And some of us said, I want no part of that. And you know, I believe the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. But we have to understand that we need to humility. Pride will hinder what God wants to do. Because many times we want to do things our way. We want God to do it the way we want it done as opposed to the way he wants to do it. And that's part of the lesson that we have to learn. It's not about our way. It's not about my way. It's about his way and us submitting our lives and ourselves to it. I remember I had this one guy. He came to me and said, well, you know, I like the Holy Spirit. I said, really? Yeah. He said, I really, I really never moved in the gifts or anything, but I, I want the gift of healing. But I don't want the gift of tongues. He was that blunt with it. What do you say to that? How many of you know that, that God gives good gifts? And that every gift that God gives is good? Even the ones that we may not quite understand? We think we know better. We think we can somehow tell God, I'd like this, I don't like that. And we don't get any of it when we come to God with those kind of conditions. Many times we want God to conform to our doctrine. Because, you know, I, I've heard that there's this line of thought, well, all these things, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, tongues and prophecy and, and miracles and healings and deliverances, they, they stopped when the apostles died. Who said? Well, I'm not experiencing them and obviously, I'm experiencing everything that God has for me. So if I'm not experiencing, therefore, I have to find a theological reason that I'm not experiencing them. Therefore, they must have stopped. Really? Maybe it's your experience that needs to be expanded. And you see, like I said, God loves to mess with our pet doctrines. He really does. I'm warning y'all. Better pull back your feet if you, <laughs> or I'll step on your toes this morning because, you know, God wants to minister in his fullness through his people to make a difference in this world. And it may not be like you think it should be. And it may go outside of your theological box. And it may totally mess things up for a while. But it's all good if you will flow in all that he has for you. We need humility. We need to confess the sin that may be a part of our lives. Sin separates us from God and sin will hinder the Holy Spirit's movement and work through your life. One of the reasons I believe that as a church in general, the thing we are so anemic is because we've allowed sin to remain in our lives. We make peace with it Instead of dealing with it, instead of repenting of it and stopping it, we make peace with it and we just kind of is there. And it's a toxic poison that eats away at the anointing that God has for us. So part of that humility is confessing sin and receiving forgiveness. 
The third thing we need to receive the baptism is we need to believe. It says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. We receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith. Don't look for a manifestation. Receive his presence. And then if the manifestation happens, allow it in your life. We believe that he will reward our sincere seeking. What does he reward us with? He rewards us with his presence. With that overflowing presence of the Holy Spirit. And he rewards us with his power to be witnesses. And a fourth thing that we need to do is we need to ask. Luke eleven thirteen. 13, if you... Jesus is speaking here, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And one of the things that I've heard, well, you know, if if God wants me to have this, then it'll just come upon me. It probably won't. Not saying God can't do it that way, but he wants to hear that we desire what he has to offer. And so we ask him. He will come upon us if we ask him to. This morning, I want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I want us to participate in this. And there was a pattern in the book of Acts that we see a number of different times. An example of this is in Acts 8, 14 through 16, or 17, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Notice that they've received the word of God. They've received Jesus. They sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, baptized with water. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That's a pattern. It's not necessarily the only way that that happens. Some of us have been by ourselves, et cetera. But the laying on of hands, and I've asked a number of different peoples and people and couples to come and to minister this. One of the things that happened, again, there were five different instances of this. One of them is Acts 19, 6, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Next week, I'm going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and about speaking in tongues. Because I realized as I was seeing this message that, that the, I, I could, we could go for a long time. But I feel like the Lord would have us to f- begin to focus on things that he wants to add to our body in an even greater measure. But one more thing before we pray. Jesus himself already prayed that you would receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. He says in John 14, 16, I will pray. I will pray the Father, ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. Jesus desired this. He went away, he said, so that the Holy Spirit can come. See, when Jesus was on the earth, he was one man. But when he left and the Holy Spirit was extended, he multiplied himself innumerably in you and in me and in all believers who will receive the baptism of the Spirit. Talk about the enemy's worst nightmare. It's one thing for Jesus to be dealt with. It's another thing for a whole bunch of people running around with his presence. Does that make sense? And you and I can be part of that company. Now, some people here may have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. But in Ephesians, there's a verse that talks about it says, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And and, and in the the original language, it's a continually be being filled. It's like just just keep on filling. And I heard and don't really like this, but it kind of makes the point. It's like I heard one evangelist say, you know, we get filled with the Holy Spirit, but some of us leak. And so we need a fresh filling. And you may be in that category this morning. And so you may want to come to one of these prayer teams and simply receive a fresh touch and be filled and continue to be filled. 
But this morning, I want us to receive. It's not just about teaching. It's about imparting and receiving what the Holy Spirit has to offer for each of us if we will submit ourselves to it today. And so I invite you to stand. And I would like to invite those couples and individuals that I asked to come to, to kind of space themselves out across the front here. And as we worship, I'm inviting you to come and these couples and individuals are going to pray. And I trust each of these individuals. One of the things that I believe the Lord instructed here probably two months ago was to establish a ministry development team. This is not elders, but this is a team of leaders for the continued developing of the ministry to take us to the next level. And this is our ministry development team. Four elders and four other members. And so we want to pray over you this morning. Why don't you bow your heads? Holy Spirit, I invite you this morning to touch and to minister here. Holy Spirit, unless you pour yourself out, nothing much is going to happen. But Lord, we know that when you pour yourself out, all things are available. And we thank you for that. So Holy Spirit, I invite you to come upon us, to extend your power to us, to touch us at our point that we need, but also, Lord, to minister in us and through us, to prepare us for the next season in each of our lives and in the life of this congregation. We bless you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.